Do you remember the civilization of ancient Egypt? I don't because it ended 2000 years ago. But you see it actually began all the way back in 3100 BC and contains a rich and unfathomable history. Now you might think that a community from 5000 years ago would be pretty rudimentary, distant from the glorious world of Starbucks and occasional annual leave we occupy today. But the ancient Egyptians were modern in their own ways, with women legally equal to men, the first recorded labour strikes, the invention of the first vibrator and of course the technology to build those enormous 3D triangles in the desert. To put into perspective how absurdly long ago that was, Cleopatra, the last ancient Egyptian ruler, lived closer to the iPhone and Pizza Hut than she did the construction of the Great Pyramids. In fact, considering just how ancient ancient Egypt is, it's astounding we know so much about it. But it's not just written records and archaeological landmarks that allow us to dive back into their history. The ancient Egyptians also left us some slightly grimmer treats. These guys. You see, ancient Egyptians believed that death, much like a visit to a service station, was just an accessory to a much longer journey. After dying, you had to navigate a dangerous underworld and receive judgement. And then if everything was peachy, you were granted access to a sort of VIP afterlife. But for this to work, your body needed to remain lifelike, so you'd be recognised as a person rather than a scramble of rotting meat. So members of the nobility, rich people and especially pharaohs would be mummified, artificially preserved through a complex chemical process to increase increase their chances of chilling for eternity. So how did ancient Egyptians use chemistry to mummify? There is a, a general process, but it, it was, it, was ver it did vary. Essentially the brain and internal organs were removed. So you often find the, the internal organs were sort of kept in these jars. And then the body was dried out. So basically with mummification, you need to stop microbes doing what they want to do, which is decay. So they use natron salt to do that. Um, and then they would pack the, cav the cavities of the body, so where they'd taken out the organs, they'd repack them with um, things like linen or sand. And then the body itself would have been coated with these sort of balms, these embalming agents, which again is what we can use chemistry to find out some of the ingredients and, and how they were made and then how they varied. They used plant oils and animal fats and these are almost like a natural waterproof layer um, or sort of like a physical barrier and this would have been something that maybe they, they knew from preserving food. Once you get to the sort of new kingdom of 1500 BC there's evidence that then they were adding uh, tree resins for example to the plant oils and animal fats and these would have not only made them smell nice but they also brought these additional yeah, antimicrobial properties that would have helped even more to preserve the bodies. Now of course mummification got better over time and it was also very much a case of you get what you pay for. Depending on the status of an ancient Egyptian, the process and quality of mummification varied. If you were skint, you'd sort of be getting a, a backstreet diet mummification that wouldn't be too robust. So the most effectively prepared and preserved mummies from ancient Egypt are those of the richest blokes that died around 1300 BC, including celebrity corpse Tutankhamun. And the ancient chemistry put to work in these mummies, even if partially guesswork, has seriously stood the test of time. Autopsies of these bodies can confirm their subjects' diets and cause of death, establish patterns of disease in wider Egyptian society, confirm their hair styles and even reproduce their voices. Although the reproduced voice just sort of sounds like hey. um you can look it up, but that was a really good impression. Tutankhamun's body was actually so well preserved, autopsies revealed so many of his illnesses, from malaria and a fractured skull to a variety of genetic defects, that the question of what actually finished him off remains a mystery. Compare this to the smashed up bones of King Richard III archaeologists recently dug up out of a car park, and the remains of King Tut, who died about 3,000 years earlier, are pretty remarkable, and a testament not just to ancient Egypt's dogmatic belief in the afterlife, but also their impressive death chemistry. And the scientific value of mummies doesn't end with funny voice reproductions. They might even allow us to save lives. Researchers are able to use DNA sequencing and CT scanning to intricately analyze the illnesses of ancient civilizations. By seeing what things like malaria and prostate cancer looked like thousands of years ago, we can learn how diseases have evolved over time, giving us potential clues for how to treat them. If you think about it, it's pretty incredible. An ancient science designed to preserve life might do just that, thousands of years later in today's world. A truly poetic summation, but not the end of the video. 
Over the course of history, people didn't treat mummies with quite as much reverence as we do today. Rich European Victorians would actually host mummy on wrapping parties, permanently ruining these historical artefacts in the name of not science, but drunkenly impressing their awful friends. Of course, these days we're a little bit more careful, and the formidable chemical preservation of ancient mummies allows archaeologists to virtually unwrap them, learning a great deal without causing any physical damage. It's pretty amazing to think that a rudimentary form of chemistry managed to achieve its goals and sustain in its subjects for such an incredibly long time. And it's a real testament to science that we're able to draw so much in the present from artefacts so distantly rooted in the past. It sort of makes you think, I wonder what will be left of our civilization. Hopefully not that.